Greetings and salutations, fellow soldiers. Welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about active listening or active viewing. As we approach our culture, particularly the arts, we need to do so with intentional engagement, looking at art in context, analyzing and evaluating theme, worldview, and meaning within it so that we can be better consumers of art, better producers of art, and use the cultural touchstones of art to convey the gospel. As the Bible says, there is no God. Humans have no advantage over animals. Everything is meaningless. Money is the answer for everything. Get out of here, Baldy. I'm Pastor Shane. I'll be your context provider today as we appropriate some culture. One of the most maddening things for the biblically literate is when people take the Bible out of context. Everything I quoted earlier is in the Bible, but when looked at in context, it takes on different meaning. In context, there is no God becomes the fool says in his heart there is no God. And the sort of nihilism and despondency conveyed in Ecclesiastes is if one is viewing the world through the lens of naturalism or materialism, everything under the sun. Apart from God, apart from salvation, all of life is meaningless. That's the context. And when it says, get out of here, baldy, the context is, if you say things like that to bald or balding men, you will be eaten by bears. That's the context. Look it up. As our culture becomes increasingly biblically illiterate, we're treated to such statements like this. I believe this is God's work, and there's a wonderful scripture about the security of elections that I want to I want to read, and that maybe some of us may have never heard before. It's 2 Peter 1.10. Brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. I love that scripture because this is what our watchers do. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Obviously, the Apostle Peter is not talking about voting. In fact, election in Scripture is sort of the opposite of the democratic process. But just as people take the Bible out of context and glom on to certain words, which leads to poor interpretation, Christians, too, can be illiterate when it comes to the arts. And just in the same manner, we can obsess over the use of certain words and disregard the context and the meaning behind the words. Usually, that centers on the use of naughty words. If you want a more complete breakdown of that, you can go back and watch episodes episodes 9 and 10, where we discuss that in length. But the broader point here is that Christians sometimes approach art with the same sort of superficiality that the world approaches the Bible, focused on a word or two, but completely bypassing the themes, meaning, or context, which is to say we miss the forest for the trees. And we can approach it just as lazily as the world approaches the Bible, where it becomes reductive to G-rated is good and R-rated is bad. But the rating system is a counting system more than it is an analytical system. Counting how many swear words. Is there nudity or not? Is there violence or not? More importantly, is there gore or not? The rating system can tell you what's in a film, but it doesn't tell you what it means. It has very little to do with context. My favorite illustration of this is the G rated 1939 classic The Wizard of Oz. Why can't Hollywood make films like that again? Everybody loves The Wizard of Oz. Christians love The Wizard of Oz. It's a wonderful family-friendly affair. But thematically, it's really quite antithetical to Christianity. Oz, this godlike figure, Oz, the great and powerful, isn't actually great, isn't actually powerful. It's really just a mirage, a man behind a curtain who can't actually help you. Salvation can't be found in the great and powerful wizard. The solution to your problems can only come from within. The scarecrow always had a brain. The lion always had courage. The tin man always had a heart. And the power to go home was within Dorothy all along. That's nothing but humanism. And it's completely and totally contrary to Christianity. But at least it's got no swear words, nudity, or gore, right? Just like with the Bible, things have to be interpreted in context. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't some good themes contained in The Wizard of Oz as well, and it doesn't mean you shouldn't watch it or you should burn your copy. Again, as we have repeatedly stated, sin is not external. It's not what goes in that makes you impure. But the point is, meaning and context matters. The same rigor of hermeneutics and exegesis that we apply to Scripture ought to also apply to the art we consume. 
Some of the most pro-Christian films out there are R-rated, and some of the most anti-Christian and insidious themes are G-rated. Things like Muppet Babies pushing transgenderism. Now that isn't to say that we're harmed by a message or theme that goes over our head. If it's not internalized, it's probably not going to have much of an effect or reshape our thinking. I've seen Christian parents freak out because their kids listen to songs in a foreign language that are risque or foul. Even though the kids have no idea what the words mean, it's still subliminally getting into them. But psychological studies have shown that subliminal messaging doesn't really work. Now, there was a study done when a department store played a message that spoke out against shoplifting below the human hearing range and among the ambient music. You couldn't hear the anti-shoplifting message, but subliminally it was coming in. And they found that the percentage of shoplifting did go down. So subliminal messaging works. No. Uh, store employees were aware of the subliminal messages that were being pumped out and they were some of the shoplifters. So it made them a little self-conscious and they backed off their five-finger discounts. Again, biblically, it's not what goes in that makes us impure subliminally or otherwise. So the goal of active listening and active viewing is not to protect from harmful messages that we might miss. If we miss it, it's not gonna harm us. But it is to make us better consumers and so better producers and even better evangelists. Let's take that first one, better consumers. The Christian writer Andrew Claven wrote an essay called The Crisis in the Arts, Why the Left Owns the Culture and How Conservatives Can Begin to Take It Back. It's written from a conservative standpoint, but more importantly, there's a lot of principles in there that also apply to Christians and culture. It's also 99 cents on Amazon, so you can read the whole thing if you want to. But he says this, some evangelical Christians made the mistake of attacking the delightful Harry Potter novels because Potter is a wizard and wizardry and magic are against Christian teaching. But Potter's wizardry existed in a completely fantastical world that did not play by the same rules as the real world. In the context of that world, his fictional wizardry not only exemplified excellent moral values, it also laid the foundations for faith. The novels are deeply Christian when judged not by their individual incidents, but by their overall effect. By condemning them, the evangelicals lost a hugely popular teaching tool. Which leads me to today's sponsor. Appropriate in the Culture is brought to us by Quidditch. Imagine all the excitement of soccer, but off along the sidelines, two people are searching for a needle in a haystack. The game doesn't stop until one of them finds it, and when they do, their team gets 150 points, basically making everything else that happens on the field moot. Yep, that's really what Quidditch is. Quidditch! Really dumb. Alrighty, so, uh, there are certainly problems in the Harry Potter universe, but Clavin's point, I think, is well articulated in that Christians get lost in the superficial aspect of the story and don't look at the story in context. Yes, there's magic, just as there's magic in C.S. Lewis's Narnia series, as well as Tolkien's Lord of the Rings series, but it really should be viewed in context. Otherwise, it's not proper exegesis. By the same manner, you could condemn the Bible because it contains sorcery, magicians, witches, not to mention it has idolatry, it has adultery, it has murder, it has incest, it has infanticide, it has rape, it has torture, it has drunkenness, it has cannibalism, it has gore. That's what it has, but that's not what it means. It doesn't say anything about its themes or its worldview or why it includes such things. By bettering our analysis of culture, by looking at art in context, we become better consumers, not rejecting things for trivial reasons, but supporting art that furthers Christian ideas. Scott Derrickson is a professing Christian and a horror filmmaker, and his films are laced with Christianity. Uh, Deliver Us From Evil, not one of his better films, but it actually has a conversion scene in it. And yet I know a lot of Christians who won't go see something like that because horror films are somehow intrinsically bad or something. Now again, you don't have to watch or listen to anything that you're not into, but by approaching things as active audience members, we become better consumers and can better support material that comports with Christianity. And by being better consumers, we become better producers because we're no longer approaching art superficially. And it opens up a range of subject matter. Here again, Clavin is helpful. The single biggest mistake conservative culture warriors make is this. They expect conservative culture to look conservative. It will not. If the purpose of culture is to record and convey the internal human experience in its entirety, it is going to record and convey a good many things of which we disapprove. 
There is simply not getting around the wickedness, corruption, greed, lust, and sheer troublemaking goofiness lodged in the hearts of the best of us, and therefore, there is no getting around their entertainment value or their legitimacy as subjects for art. He goes on, Conservatives should have no problem with the art of darkness if it is also the art of truth. Conservatives should not be afraid to make and praise art that depicts the worst aspects of human nature as long as it does so honestly. That is, in the context of the moral universe in which every choice has its price and every action has its consequences, whether internal or external or both. He's speaking in political terms, but it's also true for Christians. Christians should also not be afraid to make and embrace art that depicts the worst aspect of human nature as long as it does so honestly, because that's what the Bible does. Active viewing makes us better consumers, better producers, and also evangelists. As we said last week, inviting someone to read a book or watch a movie is a lot easier than inviting someone to church. And if we've trained ourselves to analyze and interpret art, then everything, either by agreement or contrast, can be a touchstone to convey our biblical worldview, right? Oh, I still agree with the moral underpinnings of Harry Potter. Or let me tell you why I think the themes of The Wizard of Oz are nonsense. Active viewing, active listening, being as careful and as intentional with interpretation of culture as we are with the Bible will make us better consumers, better producers, and better evangelists in order to better appropriate the culture. Well, that's it for today. As usual, share, like, write a review, even follow me in the cultural trenches of Facebook, Twitter, and Locals, and I'll see you next week for more Appropriate in the Culture. (laughs) 